Thank you both. Shall we pray together? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power it contains and the way it transforms us. And we pray this day that you'll speak to us afresh through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think Sue said this passage is now becoming quite familiar to us. Uh, we've read it for several weeks now. Uh, and I think it was Jess who said it's good that we're focusing um, and keep reading the, the full passage e each time because it's important with God uh, that we see the big picture. Often in our lives we get focused on the here and now and sometimes we get distracted and we don't see how things fit together. And when we've looked at these individual components as we've been doing week by week, we're starting to build up quite a good picture of what it means to love and the sort of characteristics that we need God to develop within us if we are to be imitators of our God. I think most people have an appreciation of what love is, whether you have faith and believe or, or whether you don't, you'll have an idea of what love means to you. Uh, for a lot of time in this church, since I've been part of this fellowship, uh, I was called to spend time with our young people, uh, our youth, if you like. Um, so I was over old youth leader for quite a long time, uh, close, close to 20 years, I think it was, in, in the end. That season's finished now, and I'm into a, a different season in, in my journey uh, with Jesus. Uh, but during that time, I had many conversations uh, with the young people, some who believed in God, some who didn't believe, some who were seeking some whose minds were quite closed. And during that time, uh, we spoke about love many times. And if I was to summarise um, what they said to me and put it into sort of language that would um, relate to, to us here as a fellowship, then it would go something along the lines of, um, love is to put yourself in someone else's place, to walk in their shoes, to feel their feelings, to weep with their tears, to rejoice in their joys, to take on their burdens, and ultimate, ultimately, love is to give your life for another. I think it's quite a good definition, and I think it's fitting with what we get from Paul in this passage. It's a little bit more concise. And if we want it to be even more concise, in the Bible, we're told simply, God is love. And for that to be true, and I think we all believe it to be true, then we should see some evidence of that. And in Jesus, of course we do. Because Jesus came and took on fully human form to be like us, to walk in our shoes, to experience all the trials and tribulations that life has to throw at us. He experienced the full range of emotions. It even tells us in the Bible that Jesus cried. Jesus wept, it says. And that was at the occasion when he returned to be with Martha and Mary at the death of their brother Lazarus. Those tears of sorrow soon transformed into joy as God did something mighty. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And in doing so gave us a little bit of an inkling of what Jesus' primary mission was. Of course, during that three and a half years ministry, many people were touched by the Lord. Many came to him seeking him out those that society had rejected, the outcasts we might call them, those that were sinners, that the higher-ups had wanted nothing to do with, those that were in desperate need. He gives sight to the blind, he healed the crippled. Even those that were possessed, he freed. This is our Jesus. But ultimately, his mission was to go to the cross, to give that ultimate sacrifice, the greatest manifestation of love that the world could ever know and will ever know, comes in the form of our Lord and Saviour Jesus. The truth is, as we all know, that God hates sin, yet we are all sinful and he loves us. And because of that great love that he has for us, Jesus does what is necessary and goes to a place we don't have to go to because of that great depth of love he has for his children. 
Of course, we have to respond. We have to believe in him. We have to believe in what he did, that he took on the sins of the entire world. All of ours and all of everybody else's, past, present and future, so that we could come to the cross and be benefactors of what he has done. Because sin requires a price, and that price is in blood. But rather than take our blood, God offers his own. That's how much that he loves us. Often what we find when we dip, dip, dip into scripture is the way of God is much different to our way. And the challenge for us and what we're called to do is to try and imitate what we've seen as much as we can. So to be like Jesus. I think I've mentioned it before, I used to have an arm, a little wristband that says WWJD, what would Jesus do? It was a reminder for me that there are many occasions when I wasn't doing what Jesus would do. In the Bible, in the Psalms, a place that I think a lot of us like to go to, um, there's a Psalm called Psalm 103, and in it, Jesus talks, uh, God talks about um, forgiveness. Because at the core of what we're looking at this morning in Love Keeps No Record is forgiveness. Last week, Anthony spoke to us about um, love is uh, not easily angered. And of course, he had to touch on forgiveness. But here, we're at, we've got to go much deeper into, into this, this word that we use so easily. Because I think probably of all the negative elements of that letter in terms of the things that we mustn't do, a bit like the Ten Commandments, there's things that we should do, the things that we mustn't do, and this is one of the things that we mustn't do, is keep a record. And yet, I think it's probably the one that's the hardest of them all in one sense, because I think probably every single one of us at some point in our journey has kept records. And sometimes we might be deceived into thinking we do that in order for our own protection to avoid continually getting hurt. But if we're being honest, the real reason for keeping a record is to use it. And we want to use it perhaps to get our own back or to make the people who have hurt us feel bad, feel guilty. That's not the way that God deals with things. In Psalm 103, it says this. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. When we go back to the time of the Psalms, it reminds us of the age of the law, because the law was in operation then, as it was in Jesus' day too. That was replaced by the age of grace because what Jesus came to do was to change things. He transforms. But at this time, it was the age of the law. And in order for God's chosen people to um, atone for their sins, God laid out a process for them. A lot of the Psalms were written by David, King David. Um, but there were other contributors too, including his son Solomon, who also became king. We remember him more for wisdom and for the book of Proverbs, amongst other things. But he was the man who was given the task of overseeing the building of the temple. Prior to that, of course, there was the sacrificial system already established. In fact, there was the tabernacle. So when the Hebrews left Egypt in that great escape... They took with them and constructed and deconstructed through all those years in the wilderness, the tabernacle. Once a year, the sins of the nation will be atoned for. That day we know as Yom Kippur. And with this temple that was coming, with this temple that Solomon was overseeing, there were some instructions very much similar to instructions that were given for the tabernacle itself. It had to be facing east, for example. And that's quite significant because it means that the temple had an easterly point and also the opposite of east is west, a westerly point. To the east was the place where the sacrifices were offered. 
that were made to the west the high priest would take the blood from the sacrifices and sprinkle to the west was the holy of holies the place the hebrews believed god resided on earth it was also the place where the ten commandments which we say we read out in the first service this morning uh, were located in the ark of the covenant and so on this holy of holy days the priest would go back and forth from east to west in order to go through the processes that God had laid out in order for forgiveness to flow. We might say that forgiveness was only temporary because it happened repeatedly. But nonetheless, there was a way of doing it. And at the end of that day came the finale, if you like, where the sins of the nation and therefore the sins of everybody were sent away from that land using the scapegoat never to come back again because as the psalmist writes here that's the way God deals with forgiveness he could keep a record but he chooses not to and the challenge for us is to do likewise in the Hebrew the word for east and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong because I normally do is, is Kadim and it has another meaning too as a lot of words do and the other meaning is everlasting and I've got this picture of this goat going off, never to be seen again, on a journey that's still continuing now. So no matter how hard we try and get those things back, we'll never get them back. And I was trying to think of an illustration uh, that might help us. Uh, and the best thing I could come up with is this. This last summer just gone by, in some parts of God's world, they experienced record temperature. I don't think we quite managed to hit those levels in Cleveland, but we did have quite a lot of good days in the summer. So what I'd like you to do is just remember what for you was the warmest day of the year so far. It certainly isn't today because it's quite chilly in here, isn't it? And uh, this side's never been as popular as, as, as it has been over these last few weeks, <laughs> barely a seat free. Um, but I'd like you to remember what was for you uh, the hottest day in the summer. I suspect it was probably in June because we did have quite a good, good, good June this year. Um, and I'd like to, uh, you to imagine that um, God's sending you on a journey. And before you start that journey, of course, you need to get, get dressed, get washed and all that. Um, for me, I'd probably be in sh shirts and a T-shirt because uh, when it's a hot day, uh, I perspire quite quickly. Uh, so I'd wear something quite, quite light. Um, but you've also been told to put a backpack on. This is a cloth backpack. Uh, you think probably... Okay, I'm going to take some water with me, take some food, because it's maybe a longer journey um, to sustain me through, through the course of, of, of the day. But instead of food and water, something else goes into that pack. pack. It's very heavy. It actually is rocks, different sizes. And the more that they go in, the heavier it seems to feel. But, of course, it's the start of the day and you feel quite fresh. So you set off on your journey. But as you continue along that path that you've been gi given... Slowly but surely, things seem to start to weigh you down. That weight that you're carrying starts to take its toll. There are some stopping points along the way, a bit like a marathon race, really, where you can go and grab some water. There's nobody at these uh, stations. It's just purely the water. And you take the opportunity each time it's given to you to, to get refreshed. But nonetheless, as the journey continues and the heat starts to hit you even more, perspiring, lots of sweat stains on your clothes. It gets to the point where you feel that next step I can't possibly take. I know the weight's on my back, but my legs just feel like lead. And then you come to another station, but this time it is manned, just one man there. And he offers to help you. He gives you the opportunity to take things out of your backpack. Those things, those rocks, that are weighing you down, those burdens that are weighing you down are the records that you're holding. You've had opportunities to let them go. But he says if you do that, you'll never see them again. You take that opportunity and suddenly things are different. You're still, your clothes are still soiled with sweat, but now the load, the load is very light. So you continue on and you make it where you've been sent to go. 
And that's what it's like if we keep records. We get burdened. It prevents us getting into the direction God wants us to go. So what does that look like? Well, going back to scripture, and I used um, Joseph's story quite recently when I was preaching in the evening service. Joseph, uh, as you remember from the Genesis account, was a boy heavily favored by his father. He was blessed greatly by God. But there was a price with that, and the price was his brothers became resentful of him. They became jealous of him to the point where they wanted rid of him and rid of him permanently. They wanted to kill him. But instead, they settled for sending him into slavery, into a place where they thought they'd probably never see him again. He ended up in Egypt. He had many ups and downs, but he never lost faith in God, and God never abandoned him. Eventually, he rose to a mighty, powerful position to be second in charge in the whole of the land of Egypt, effectively a prime minister there. And then, as prophesied, a severe famine comes. And so the brothers that are left behind now need to seek help. And they go to Egypt. They don't recognize him straight away. Obviously, the years have changed. He must have changed in appearance quite significantly. But he knows them. He has an opportunity to get his own back if he wants to. He's now a very powerful man. But instead, he reacts much differently. In fact, when he finally reveals himself to his brothers, he makes sure everybody else is out of the room. It's not because he's holding a record. He doesn't want anybody else to know what they did to him. He's prepared to offer them unconditional forgiveness. And as a result, they relocate in this land of Egypt and survive the famine. Many years later, their father, Jacob, dies. And at that point, the brothers once more get worried, thinking perhaps along the lines, well, maybe he didn't get his own back to us because dad was still around. But now dad's gone. Perhaps things will change. They had no need to fear because he'd allowed that past to go from as far as the east is from the west. A bit like the sins on the scapegoat. They were never going to be used again. And that's the place, I believe, God wants us to be. When we consider this word forgiveness, I believe, and again, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, um, I believe in the word in Greek, it's Apollo, Apollo, something like that. Um, and it has, like Hebrew words sometimes have, more than one meaning. So I believe this word was also used when Barabbas was freed instead of Jesus. I also believe it was used when the woman who was crippled, and she, I think she'd been crippled for something like 18 years, 17, 18 years, um, with terrible illness, came seeking Jesus out, and just one touch healed her. I believe the Lord used that word then too. And also, when Paul and Barnabas were sent forth from Antioch to go on their mission, it has multiple different meanings. And I believe what God is saying to us today is, if we keep hold of things, if we keep these records, then we can't possibly do and go where he wants us to go that we'll be crippled a bit like the woman, that we won't be released if we can't forgive. It will burden us and in the end, grind us to a halt. I believe Jesus wants us to be in the place that Joseph arrived at. Not in Egypt, but in that place where he's prepared to offer unconditional forgiveness. Because that's the way God is. Each one of us here today, I believe, have benefited from that in that we've been able to come to the cross freely. In repentance, yes, but also knowing that the God who offers forgiveness forgives fully. Never to hold those things against us again. 
In this season of Advent, we've got much to look forward to. We've got much to look forward to in concerning Jesus because he is coming back. We may not know the exact hour or the day, but the one who opened those gates of grace will return. Things will be much different then. Things will be like they should have been before we mess things up. The God that we serve is a forgiving God and there's no limit to the forgiveness that he offers. So my prayer as I end this morning is simply this, that each one of us find that place where we can truly let go of those things that hold us back and keep no record because the truth is our God doesn't keep a record and we should be like him. Amen.